Hello and welcome to Cricket Nagar. Uh, I am Mehran Zaidi, and uh, today we have with us uh, one who needs no introduction, a legendary Australian uh, coach, Mr. John Buchanan, uh, with me today. Uh, welcome, sir. It's a real privilege to have you with us. Hello, man. Nice to be here. So I'll just straight away dive into the few questions I have. Uh, sure. Yeah. So just uh, first of all, just your uh, comment on the classic. Uh, Border Gavaskar Trophy, which we just witnessed few months back, the India Australia series, which was some people are just saying it was probably one of the greatest series, uh, test series in history, comparing it with the 2005 Ashes. So, what was your take on that? Yes, look, it was a it was a thrilling series. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, both both teams um, probably exhibited uh, strengths and weaknesses at different times, which allowed either team to uh, to secure wins but then of course the final test match in Brisbane where you know um, really a fortress for Australian cricket and India going into that test match missing quite a number of the normal lineup it certainly seemed to stack the odds in Australia's favour but uh, that was not the the, uh, the end result it was a fantastic uh, result for India in terms of the way that they uh, they played that particular game and with a few debutants in the side. So I think that really added to the the series, the thrilling nature of the series. And uh, and of, of course, it, it is always so difficult uh, to win away from home. And, um, you know, India managed to do that again. Yes. So also, uh, after that series, uh, there was a lot of debate uh, about uh, Tim Payne's captaincy and uh, some people even some options were being suggested, like maybe Pat Cummins should be made a captain. Some were even saying we should go back to Steve Smith. Now with the Ashes uh, coming up, uh, I think this might be, you know, make and break for Tim Payne. If he loses, then it's going to be, I think, very tough for him to continue as the test captain. So what? how do you think, his, his, what his future holds? Because, of course, he's not that, uh, you know, that inspirational uh, uh, captain like maybe like Ponting was or Steve was. Or even uh, Michael Clark. Uh, so, how do you, do you think he has he's under a lot of pressure because of the, you know, the lineage, the back, uh, the his predecessors? Yeah, look, there's no doubt uh, any Australian captain, whether it's captain of the Test side, the One Day side, T20 side, um, will always be under the microscope, whether it's Australian teams or Indian teams or. Yeah, of uh, English teams, whomever, you know, so they're always under the microscope. I think Tim Payne, one of his strengths is that he's probably not as overt um, in terms of his actions and his behaviours um, that as a spectator we would see and we're used to seeing from a Coley or a, or a Ponting, as you say. Um, but I think he's a real strong character in the dressing room. I think that he and Justin Langer work and have worked extremely well together. And I think that's been part of the reason for the test team's um, turnaround since uh, South Africa. Uh, so I think he, he's played an integral role in that and therefore obviously uh, will continue to do so through this Ashes series. But I think he has already said that uh, post the Ashes series, it may be time to look elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. It may be time to look for another successor to him because again he's only playing one format of the game yeah. and I do think wherever possible it's really important that you do have just the one leader I think it becomes a little bit confusing and, and definitely more complicated more complex for a group of people with different leadership in different formats so um, certainly come the end of the ashes no matter what the result and, and hopefully it's an Australian uh, victory but um, you know, we have to wait and see on that one. But I do think there will be a review of Tim Payne himself and from selectors and everybody else that's associated with the team to see who might be the, the best leader to take the team forward. And hopefully that leader would be part of all sides. Yes, sir. Also, there's, there's a lot of, there was a lot of criticism on Justin Langer's coaching style and uh, there was some even reports that some players are unhappy with him. And you think this this Ashes would might also be a litmus test for Langer also? Look, um, all coaches will always 
feel that sort of commentary because as a coach, it's not necessarily always a popularity contest. Yeah. Um, you're there to actually drive culture in the side, drive performance in the side and get results. And so in doing so, uh, you always tend to uh, please some and not please others. So those comments are, are probably pretty standard. I think, uh, again, Justin brings to that side a, a discipline that they were lacking, uh, had been lacking for, you know, uh, from previous setups. And I think that's why he was brought into the role to, to really instill that discipline, that culture and the key values, I suppose, that Australian cricket has been known for for a long period of time. And I think he's done that. Uh, but as I say, in doing so, that certainly will upset certain certain players at, at different times. But, um, you know, again, like all coaches, like Tim Payne, as we just said before, we, in the end, you get judged on results. So, you know, if the results are not coming, uh, then certainly everybody in leadership roles will be certainly under the under the microscope and under the scrutiny of whether or not they should be retained, and if so, for how long. So one thing which we really uh, saw in the Border Gavaskar Trophy was the Indian bench strength, and uh, now with the especially now with the in white ball cricket, it said that in India is probably along with England the best bench strength in the world, and now one team is playing in England, another is in Sri Lanka, and and the first match they comprehensively beat. Uh, probably it was the main the, the main Sri Lankan team, and with all the young Indian players were there and uh, Prithvi Shaw and uh, Ishan Kishan and even Suri Kumar Yadav under Shikhar Dhawan. So, how do you see the last three four years India has really uh, you know developed this bench strength? So, what do you think is the reason behind it, and how do you see it? Yes, well, there's no doubt. I mean, in theory, India should have the best bench strength uh, for any team in the world, simply because of the numbers who play cricket. Um, but I think uh, part of the reason why that's improving, that there's no doubt that IPL has played a significant role um, in promoting white ball cricket, short form cricket, and India is the home of, of the IPL. And so all the young Indian cricketers of the future, both boys and girls, uh, are just glued to their TV sets, to their phones, or, or getting to the grounds to watch um, Indians really uh, take the, the sort of T20 game by the scruff of the neck. So I think that's certainly one factor. I think along with that, then is there have been some very very good players who have emerged, you know, from really that IPL probably since um, you know mid. Uh, 2012, 13, 14, somewhere in that period, you know, so there have been some very, very uh, good Indian players that have really promoted uh, their expertise in that short ball arena. And, and couple that with the successes that they've had, um, it, it really does then encourage people to want to be part of, of, of Indian teams in the future, but certainly part of the white ball team. So again, though, um, when you come to tournament play, it's a bit like if people follow rugby union and the All Blacks. Yeah. Um, you know, New Zealand rugby is extremely strong. You know, their provincial sides are extremely strong. You know, they they beat you know Australian provincial sides pretty easily these days, but they will beat most sides. But in the end, you can only pick, put fifteen players on the field, and you can only have uh, another eight sitting on the bench in your tournament. And so in cricket, you know, we can only put 11 on the field and, and uh, I think the, the limit on your squad is 15 or maybe it's extended a little bit because of COVID these days. Um, so what that really means is that no matter how deep your talent base is in your country, it really comes down to, you know, your final 15 or 16 or 17 players in a tournament. And, you know, that really begins to level the playing field a little bit between, you know, all teams, certainly all, the, all the, the main playing teams. And that's even leveled further because it's a T20 tournament and possibly even leveled a little bit more because the games have been played in Oman and Dubai. So, um, and, and, and one more levelling factor is that, that countries very rarely play T20 cricket. You know, individuals might in the various leagues, but as a country, 
uh, you very rarely play it. So there's a whole lot of factors that I think make this uh, T20 World Cup uh, pretty enthralling in terms of uh, trying to understand who might begin to emerge as the, uh, the likely winners. So, and uh, how do you see Australia's chances in the T20 World Cup? Because now when the West Indies have quite comfortably, uh, you know, they were beating them 4-1. And that fifth match also, I think, when that brilliant over from Michelle Stark probably stopped it from being a whitewash. So, how do you see some changes? Maybe Josh Inglis, because there are a lot of hype about Inglis now and uh, some more changes. Yeah, look, I think, um, again, as we're just saying, countries very rarely play T20 yeah. cricket. Um, they obviously play a lot more when you're leading into a, a World Cup uh, event. Um, but in terms of uh, the T20 game, I think it's it's a game, the shorter the game, I think the more precise your skills have got to be. And if you haven't played cricket for a while, then it does take bowlers, batters, fielders, you know, time to uh, basically get their best game back together. And then once they've got their best game back together, then they've actually got to adapt that to the T20 format. So I think it takes time. Um, and the more T20 games you can get under your belt, therefore the more precise your skills can be, which is really what T20 requires because, you know, one ball in 120 is almost almost 1% of the game or 1% yeah. of an innings, you know, whereas one ball in a 50 over game is, is one 300, so 0.03%. So that's why your skills have got to be more precise because one ball, even though it could be a wicket four or six, no matter in whatever format, it has a bigger impact on the T20 outcome. So I think Australia's performances, performances in T20 will definitely improve given the experiences they've had in the West Indies. And um, you know, coming into the tournament, they'll still be a little bit underdone, but the more games that they can put together, they can become reasonably dangerous. But at this stage, you know, I'd see them as an outside chance of making the semifinals. This is the last couple of questions. Uh, first, I just wanted to uh, ask you about England's rotation policy. There's a lot of some criticism also that sometimes they rest players, inform players, and which they have and because of which sometimes they've even uh, lost matches because of resting key players. And uh, so, what's your take on this rotation policy of England? Um, well, look, firstly, uh, I've made some comment around uh, a few Australian guys that uh, made themselves unavailable to go to the West Indies because of, as they said, fatigue from being in a bubble too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, my, in my opinion, um, you know, that fatigue was due to the fact that they chose to go to the IPL. They weren't necessarily forced to go to the IPL. It was their own particular choice. So I was very disappointed in that decision or those decisions that those individuals took. I do understand, of course, that um, you know athletes are there to maximise their earnings from the skills that they have, no matter what the sport. And as we know in sport, you don't have a long time uh, in the game. Your careers can be quite short. And so you're trying to maximise your earnings at that particular moment in your life. And you're quite free to go and um, play wherever you want to around the world. But in a sense, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't necessarily, in my opinion, um, make yourself available for a tournament where um, as the employer, in this case, Cricket Australia, hasn't necessarily said, well, this is part of your development plan. We want you to be there because we think that'll be really important for you to learn more about your game in terms of playing in India and playing against certain players. Uh, no, they went there on their own volition, uh, really, for, for, uh, for earning capacity. Uh, and then said, well, when the employer says, well, we now need you to come to the West Indies to play in a tournament. No, we're not available because we're fatigued. Uh, that's not on, in my opinion. So um, in terms of what England are doing, though, it, it's, the, it's the reverse. They, they've got a squad, um, you know, of I'm not sure how many players, 30, 35 players, maybe a few more, maybe a few less. Um, and what they're trying to do is, is develop that whole squad so that that whole squad is uh, in best possible shape for whatever the tournament's to. Uh, are coming up. You know, it was my, when I was director of cricket uh, for New Zealand, that was something that we were trying to do at that stage. So we were trying to, a bit crystal ball goes, you know, four years out. Um, here are the players we've got now. Uh, 
obviously there are a number of younger players that will come through in that period of time. There will be some older players who will uh, move on and, and obviously players will you know, not perform well, so they can't necessarily hold their selection and there'll be others that are injured. Um, so it won't be a precise system, but really what becomes important, what England, I think, are doing well is that they're trying to manage a group of players so that, yes, you won't always have the so-called best 11 on the field, but what they are doing is narrowing the gap between what your best 11 is and maybe what your second best 11 is. Um, and so the only way you can do that is really to give players experience in the game. That's the only place you can really learn the game. We can do all the training we want and all the physical preparations we want and all the team meetings we want, but ultimately you learn your game in competition. And so uh, I think what they're trying to do is make sure that the, the less experienced, the younger players are getting more experience while the older players are probably getting a little bit rest where they don't need uh, another game at that stage of their career. So that's one last question which I ask everybody is how do we you know in, just increase the competitive competitive teams in cricket because as it is very few countries play cricket and of 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 the few handful about uh, probably I think four or five are other are consistently good maybe India Australia New Zealand England in fact I think these four South Africa Pakistan West Indies they are just inconsistent inconsistent Sri Lanka is in the state of very sharp decline, Bangladesh is also, you know, not really reaching that level. So, how do you see? Because I think we've seen sparks in Afghanistan, Ireland also, in the South Africa series, and uh, Zimbabwe also has often, off and on, they have sometimes they've shown some competitive spirit. So, how do you see this situation? Because we'll be the same for five teams playing each other. We yeah. Yeah. yeah, we would love to see more, more, more teams in cricket. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a very difficult question. Um, you know, we've got a country just north of our borders here in Queensland, Papua New Guinea, who have uh, made the T20, yeah. you know, World Cup for the first time. And, you know, they are a shining example of just a very poorly resourced country, uh, either by way of numbers, by way of facilities, by way of coaching, by way of administration, by way of clubs, and so on. And that uh, limited resource is never really going to uh, increase significantly mm. for it to compete on somewhat of a level footing with the larger countries like Australia or South Africa or England or, or India or Pakistan. So, um, you know, what can, what can be done? Uh, I think ICC are, are doing what they can at the moment in terms of uh, trying to increase the level of competition in associate countries. Um, but I guess they need to, with those countries, actively resource them. And, and, and resourcing meaning just what I was saying, they, they will need greater access to, to better coaches, greater access to better facilities. Um, you know, greater access to possibly uh, foreign players. So, you know, one means oh, I think that could be approached in the future would be something similar to an IPL, uh, meaning that, you know, if it's Papua New Guinea competing in a T20 World Cup, well, they're allowed two or three international players of, of good quality, you know. So, in other words, we were just talking before, India's got such a yeah, yeah. deep bench strength, right? But they can only take 17 to the World Cup, uh, yet they could possibly easily pick another 17 that might yeah. quit themselves just as well. So maybe there's scope to say, well, uh, you know, we, over time, in terms of the development of those players, would see them playing a number of games for an associate country. And so it's a bit like the IPL. You bring in some foreign players, one, because of their skills, and that can help the team in terms of performance. But equally, uh, other players can see how they perform at the same stage. They can learn from them. So maybe there's, there's some sort of scope for looking at that international exchange uh, to help you know, countries that are not performing well. Say for a Sri Lanka, uh, who is, in theory, uh, you know, one of the yeah, yeah. leading... Um, nations in cricket and their decline, then it may not necessarily be anything to do with international players. 
uh, but it may have a lot to do with you know coaching expertise. Yeah, it may have a lot to do with former players uh, actively being encouraged to be involved, giving them the support and the resources. And so it is also a case that Sri Lankan cricket might then say, well, look, we don't have the, the funding uh, to to encourage those former players to, to be actively involved. So then it's a case, they put a case, a submission proposal back to the ICC for the ICC to support that sort of um, strategy for them to, to, you know, prevent the big uh, roller coaster rides that they might have over, you know, years. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot uh, for talking, talking to us. It was a great honor and was a very fun conversation, very insightful. Thank you. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. All the best.